John chapter 8, John chapter 8, I want to just talk again, okay, I'm, I'm going to talk again, and I'd like you, if you are able to stand, if you're not able, I understand, it's good, but in their times, they always stood for the whole reading of the scripture, and that sometimes took hours at a time, but here, I want to read John chapter 8, and I want to tell you about how God picks his team for the winning of the series, and the winning of the Super Bowl. It's going to be different from the way we pick. John chapter 8. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Understand, it did not say he went to 101 Jerusalem Avenue. He didn't say that. The others went home. He had no home to go to. He was homeless. He probably hit off on some cardboard or some big leaves or something and stayed. Early in the morning, again, he went to the temple. He sat down and taught them, and the scribes and Pharisees brought him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. I'm reading the King James. I could have inserted there, the man being the first act of a deadbeat wouldn't accept responsibility, and he ran off. And they didn't require much of men anyway. But Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. And what do you say? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. Well, you're wrong if you say one way or the other. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote in the dirt as though he heard them not. And so when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin, cast you the first stone at her. Listen, and again he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted in their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last one. And Jesus left, was left alone, and the woman was standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself, he saw that none but the woman, and he said unto her, Woman, where are your accusers? Hath no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. You go and sin no more. You can be seated. Thank you. We know that organizations have their specific way of choosing people to be on their team to guarantee that they will get to this day, the first Sunday in February, to be on the Super Bowl team. They do it in basketball, whether it's Krzyzewski or, or uh, any of the other great ones, or in baseball, whether you're Girardi or somebody like that, it doesn't matter. When they choose people, they choose the most athletic, they choose the fastest and the quickest they choose the most rugged. They choose the one that has more athletic acumen. They choose the strongest. They choose the one that's going to be a success when he hits the gridiron. And that goal is to have 11 men on that field that will bring home the trophy of the Super Bowl. There are feeling is, and their theory is, that the survival of the fittest is the one that wins, and that you can play and score a lot of points in one quarter, but you've got to play four quarters, and you've seen it where it says so-and-so, a certain team would yield and yield so many points in the last quarter, it's because they're weak many times. They don't train as hard. Something happens. Have you ever stopped to think how Christ would choose his Super Bowl team. Today we look for the strongest and the greatest and the biggest, the one with the best records and the best averages and the best statistics. But when Jesus picks his team, he looks for the weakest and the worst and the most downtrodden and the one with the worst record and the one with the worst sins 
and the most sins. It doesn't matter to him how bad he is or how weak a person is to play for him. He looks for the one who's willing and sees through their problems and sees not what they are, but what they can become. We have often sung the song, Just As I Am, without one plea, but that's not quite strong enough for me. I believe that it's Christ's words, not just as you are, but just as you are going to be, because he's always working on you and me just a little bit more. He has a very good record. He knows what he's doing when he picks people. But amazingly, he picks the ones with the most flaws, the ones with the most um, problems, the ones with the worst sins. It seems that he's a specialist in picking them. By the way, he picked a, a man named Abraham to start a great nation. I reverence him and think of Father Abraham and how great he was, but he was an Iraqi. And he and his father Terah were idol makers. That doesn't seem too much. We put them on our stained glass windows and say, look how great they are, but really they weren't as great as many as you. He was just an ordinary man who made idols and, and by the way, not only made idols for other people, he worshiped idols too. But look what he became. And look what Isaac did. He was a liar. And yet, he became a great father and a great patriarch. And look at what Jacob did. He was a con artist for sure. And he could cheat anybody and make them believe that he was selling the right stuff. But God made him into a man who would head many great people and countries and nations. It just seems that that's the way God does it. Look at what he did with Moses. He picked a man who couldn't do much of anything. He couldn't even talk right. He was tongue-tied. Talk like a billy goat sometimes. And yet he became one of the greatest emancipators and lawgivers whose name and writings are still on the courthouses in our lands today. And look at Rahab. I wouldn't have given you two cents for her. She was a town call girl. You can call it whatever you like. In my time, we didn't say words like what she was then. We thought that was bad to even say a word like that. And so I refrain from saying that today. But you know what she was. And she, she was the one, however, who saved those spies that went into Jericho. Incidentally. Her house was saved and her family was saved because of a scarlet cord that she hung out the window. And when Joshua came through, he said, spare the house with the scarlet cord in it. It's kind of ironic that he chose a scarlet one, isn't it? But even more ironic it is to me that when she married, she married a man named Salmon who was from the tribe of Judah. And they had babies. This woman of the streets, they had babies. And she had one baby by the name of Boaz. And he married a girl named Ruth who was a Moabitess from Moab, one of those sins of Lot himself. Wouldn't look very promising to me. I would stick clear. Mama would say, don't go near them. But he married Ruth, and Ruth obviously had something going for Boaz, and Boaz had a lot going for her. You can read it any way you want to and make them look so holy if you want to, but they were human beings, and both of them had some feelings for each other. 
And she was a woman who actually who came and laid down at his feet that night. You recall that, don't you, if you study it. And you know what he did. He liked her so much that he wanted her. And he told the people, he said, he told her, said, you walk by the, behind these people that are gleaming, gleaning in the uh, field and handfuls on purpose of the wheat and barley are going to be for you. And he said to the young men, he said, do not treat her in a bad way. You know what he meant by that. You ought to have enough brain to know what he means. You know you do. Evidently, those people in that day were rough toward women, those men were, but he wouldn't let him be. And they married, Boaz and Ruth did. Oh, they had this Moabitess woman and this Boaz who had come from a mixed marriage. They had a child by the name of Abed. Obed. They had Abed, and Abed had a son whose name was Jesse, and Jesse had a son whose name was David, King David. And because of their faith, they became in the lineage of Christ and the winning Super Bowl team. It's amazing how God picks people. I wouldn't pick some people that he picks. He picks those that I say, God, what, do you know what you're doing? And God knows what he's doing. And I want you to know that if, if, if I would, were talking to him and if he would say, I want you, I would say, God, you don't know what you want. You need to make me the last one because I'm not fit for your kingdom. I'm fit to die. I'm fit to have the cross for me and to die. But listen, not Jesus. Jesus says, but I have plans for you. And in this congregation, he's saying the same thing for you now. And he got, he's got his way of making his team up so that he knows what his team's going to be like. He knows who's going to be on the winning team. And he knows who's going to sit at the table with him. And he already has a table spread where you're going to sit. I'm just Calvinistic enough to believe that he has a chair with my name on it and your name on it. And somebody else wants it. And the devil wants it. And he wants to try to keep you and me from getting that chair. But... He's got it reserved, and you and I are going to sit at that table with the Lord one of these days, and nobody's going to take over. Put your hands together and clap for it one time. You're going to be in heaven. I know that. And nobody's going to take it from you. Glory. Let's do it a little harder. Okay, come on. Glory. Hallelujah. Heaven bound, and you know that. For some of us, it won't be as long as for others. But nobody's going to take your place. On one occasion, he had a chance to pick somebody that I would never have picked. Mama would have said, boy, if you do anything like that, you better be careful. And don't you come this way. You better run from her as fast as you can because there are a lot of things that you can catch. And there are a lot of things that can happen to you. And she happened to be a woman in the Bible in this eighth chapter of John that God had some tremendous feelings for. And Jesus evidently was able to look with piercing glances at her and see through her and see her not just as I am, but just as you're going to be. And one day while he was teaching in the temple, she was dragged in by the men people. All righteous men, older ones and younger ones, dragging her in and looking with that pious look, that holy look. They said, we caught her in the very act. What are they doing catching her in the act anyway? That's what I want to know. What are they doing snooping around on somebody else's window? If I'd have known him, I think he should have been shot. You know, I'm just kidding you. But, but something, can you imagine snooping in on somebody's window to see who it is? And, and they caught her and let the man go. Can't, listen, and let the man go. And said, you run on quickly now because we're going to take this woman and get her killed. And they could do it in the name of righteousness and truth and honor. And they said, we know what the Moses law says. He says, stoner. But what do you say? Because they wanted to trick him into saying, if he had said Moses' law is wrong, he'd have been wrong. If he'd have said it's wrong to, uh, to, to kill her, he'd have been wrong. If he'd said let her go free, he's wrong. He's wrong any way you look at it. They are trapping him. They know what to do. They think up ways all the time to trap him. That's what they were doing. Because they hated anything like him. But the Lord moved on him to say some things and do some things that as far as I know, he's never done before because I never found another instance in the Bible where he, ever done, uh, any, where he had ever done any kind of writing. 
but he wrote in the dirt. As she's lying there, he kneels down beside her and writes in the dirt. And they begin to talk to her, and nothing happens at all with, uh, with him or the other folks. I want you to remember what Jesus had just talked to these men about before he ever wrote. Jesus said, you are serpents. Now that sounds a little bit easier than saying you're a bunch of cottonmouth moccasins or you're a bunch of rattlesnakes. That's what he's saying. He had already called them that. Or you're a bunch of uh, whited sepulchers. That's a nice word for graves. That's all you are. Dead stuff comes from you. You're dead yourself, he's saying. He had already called them these things. Jesus would say nothing, but his silence broke into the noise of their questioning. And he began to write in the ground. And as he wrote, his finger moved, and the men started fading away. And Jesus looked up and said, He who is without sin, let him let him cast the first stone, the brick. Nobody took the brick. Nobody took the stone. Then he knelt down once more. You recall, you recall that? He knelt down once more. I ask you to remember it there. He knelt down once more. And then his finger started writing again. And he looked up. And he says... Woman, where are your accusers? And all of them, it said, beginning at the old. Oh, my Lord. Do you young people understand that? Beginning at the oldest daddy rabbit in the crowd. Why would that happen? I'll let you guess. They all started fading away from, the, from her. All the way down to the last one, the scripture says, the last one. And they left, and Jesus looked at her and said, where are your accusers? And she says, Lord, I have none. And he says, neither do I condemn you, but you go and sin no more. I want you to know one thing, Honestly. Because some people do not know this. Some people think that, oh, God said, it's okay to cohabit. He's not saying that. You've got the faulty reasoning if you grab that. He didn't say it was all right to have extramarital affairs. He didn't say it was all right to sleep around. He didn't say it was all right to live out of wedlock. He didn't say any of these things. He doesn't condone any sin. He doesn't condone adultery. He doesn't condone sleeping around. But he knows people are human. Where are your accusers? I, I, don't, I don't have any accusers. And Jesus never minimizes any sin that you and I commit. But what he does is he maximizes his grace to overcome these things. And to let you know that his word is still true. You can read Leviticus and you can read Deuteronomy and you'll find it written in the sacred book. But Jesus comes up and he gives his. He says, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I, uh, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Did you get it? More abundant life. John 10 and 10. Now here is Christ picking somebody on his team. And she's not one of the best, but she's actually one of the worst. I'm sorry. Worst women there in all of, Jer in all of Jerusalem. She's a bad girl. You see, Christ has a goal in life, and his goal is this. You think it's just for him to be religious? He doesn't care anything about being religious. He's got a goal. He's got a mission statement. He's come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's the only thing that he cares about. 
He wants to save the person who is lost because he came to keep you out of hell. He came to make you go to heaven. He wants us out of sin. No one in their right mind would try to cover these things. But those in the bondage of sin need to be saved and delivered. And it comes only through grace, the grace of God. And old Bill Gaither used to sing, not only because he lives, but he sang something beautiful, something good. All my confusions he understood. All I had to offer him was something I forgot. Brokenness and strife, is that it? But he made something beautiful out of my life. Now you, you run yourself down, but stop doing that because when Christ saved you, he made something beautiful out of you and he's got designs on you and he's going to see that you're going to sit in your chair. Thank you. He comes to give this peace and tranquility. You say, well, boy, gentlemen talk about peace, but there ain't no peace around here. I don't have any peace. Well, if you've got Christ, you've got the peace of God. You've got the deep, settled peace in your soul. The fact is, if you really want, I want to give you one of my insights. Peace isn't really something that he gives you on the day that you come down here to this altar or right at your seat, you accept Christ. You can say, he didn't give me peace. Peace doesn't have to come to you like that. Peace is something that you acquire through years of work and study and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life because it becomes a fruit of the Spirit so that you are developing that kind of peace. Paul told Titus, one of his young friends, preacher friends, he said to Titus in 2 and 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. See, the woman chosen on this team was caught in the middle of the street by her accusers. And now she was a member of the Blessed Hope. Hallelujah. Just amazing what God does, isn't it? I can't understand how great he can be. There is a deep, settled peace in our heart. Peace? But we have peace with God. I mean, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. John 14, 27. But there is always a deeper peace that he gives. And I found it in Romans chapter 5, where he said, we have peace with God. Now look, I want to describe it. When you are not saved... When you haven't come to Christ, you're on his hit list. You're not going to heaven. You say, well, if I get to the last bit, he's going to let me go to heaven because he's full of love. I'm not even sure about it with my insight number two, but I don't even think it's love that saves you. Then what is it? He said, through Paul's words in chapter something two, eight and nine, he said, it is for by grace that you are saved. God's riches to give you things that you don't deserve. God's riches at Christ's expense, the acronym could be. By grace are you saved. Listen, through faith. I don't have any faith. That's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. He's going to supply the faith. To every man, he's given a measure of faith. That faith is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should brag about it. He comes down and gives you enough faith and hope so that that hope can keep on fueling the faith and it will never make you ashamed. The scripture says, hope maketh not ashamed. Don't let anybody tell you that hope isn't great. There are three things that will last, faith, hope, and love. I know the greatest is love, Paul said, but the hope is the thing that fuels the faith. And it is that faith that saves you. 
You say, but yeah, but uh, I, I beg to differ because when I get ready to die, he's going to love me so much that he's going to save me right at the very last. I want to clue you in on something. You get ready to die, and you're one of those who've always turned him away and pushed him away when he'd call, and you get farther and farther away from him. You could care less whether you die and go to hell or not in most cases. Because you're in darkness. And if you're in darkness, you haven't tasted of the light. You haven't seen the light. If you can make it by the skin of the teeth, do it. But I want to make it ahead of time. Say amen, somebody. Look, I don't want to wait till the last minute. I want to know that ahead of time, I've accepted Christ as the Lord and Savior of my life. You see, we have the peace, not peace only with God, but we have access by faith unto him so that we can go to him at any time. You know, in, in the 60s, I can remember President Kennedy. I'm old enough to remember that. I remember watching him one day when the cameras were on him and he was in his study there in the White House, and I kept seeing something move around under the desk, and I said, what's happening there? And in a minute, the little head bobbed up, and, and it was little John John, and he jumped up in his dad's lap. Look, John John had free admittance into the bosom of his father, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, because he was his son. And this is what Christ does for you the moment you receive him through faith. He makes you his son or his daughter. And you can come to him innocently and honestly. And you can come to him anytime. It doesn't matter when or where. You can come right to him and it never stops. Hope and faith will make it. You say, well, I got faith. I believe he existed. The devils believe him, but they're not going to heaven. They fear and tremble, but they're not going to heaven because they believe in the head. Let it move from your head to your heart, 18 inches, and reach out and say, Father, give it to me, and you know that you're going to have it. It was just like last night when our granddaughter was with us for the picture we told you about. I'd come in from with, with uh, Mildred from the, I'm just kidding you about Mildred, I'm Mildred, from the grocery store. And, and I got there and I, I bought a thing of blueberries because Faith loves them so much about like this right here. And Caroline saw them and when she said, do you mind if I have some of those blueberries? What do you think I'm going to do? Say, oh, that's for Faye. I said, oh, you won't. You know why? Because she's mine. Look, I'd have done you the same way. But I'm telling you, I'm trying to get my illustration across. God loves you so much that he's given you everything. You don't have to steal it from him. You don't have to take it. God loves you already. He's already given it to you. Can't you understand that? Everything, everything belongs to you that belongs to God. And we know this about his love. It's shed abroad so that we can all receive it and all these things. But it's not our love for him. It's his love for us. And when it comes to us, he says, you're a member of my team. And you're a member of my team. And you're a member of my team. And we're going to win the Super Bowl. We don't have to outguess him. We're going to win the Super Bowl, and we're going to win it hands down. Amen. That's it. Let's stand, everybody. Good. Look, I want to ask you something. Are you a member of his team? If you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have been accepted into the royal family of Christ and he is your savior, not somebody else's, I want to see your hand. Are you just putting it up because somebody else does? Don't you do that. All right, put them down. Is there anything that's begun to break the fellowship? Let's, clear, uh, let's pray right now and pray about it right now all over the house. Father God, I want to just thank you because this day is a special day for every person here. I want to ask you, Lord, to let this be a day when we will make up our mind to say, I'm going to run with Christ. I'm going to be on his team. And he's going to do something to make something beautiful out of my life. I ask you for that. And God, I will not be denied because you promised me that as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons 
and the daughters of God, even those who will believe in his name. And right now, Lord, here we come. You won't deny us, Lord. I know you won't. Why were you standing right there in this place? Right on, if you're looking at it on television, on closed circuit, on a type of computer, whatever, I want you right now to be honest with yourself and say something's breaking the relationship and the friendship that I have in Christ. And I want you to pray that God will forgive me and set me free this day before we leave this house on Super Sunday. John, I want you to pray for me because I'm not really sure about it. I'm, I've done some things that are wrong, and I want him to make it just like that woman. It doesn't have to be what she did. He can't tolerate any sin. Look, he wants to cleanse you of all sin. And right now you have an advocate with the Father who will wash you with the blood. Pastor John, pray for me because I want to go to heaven. Put your hand up right now all over the house. Go ahead. Don't be afraid of it. Amen. All right, put them down. Notice I didn't say 8, 10, 15, whatever. It doesn't matter. God knows where you are right now. I want everybody here to pray a prayer with me right where you're standing. If you can pray it honestly, because I want you to look at me, and this is what I want to tell you before you pray it. Heaven's free. You cannot buy your way into heaven. It's a free gift. By grace are you saved through faith. Grace means it's free. Every one of us is a sinner, part two. Every one of us is a sinner. If Billy Graham was standing here, he'd say, listen, I'm the worst sinner of all. I know God, I know his love, but listen, love has got to be tempered with justice. And what is just about him is equals his love. You cannot have his love without his justice. So he settled that that somebody's got to pay in the presence and in the place of Jesus Christ, his son. And he said, Jesus will pay it. He's paid it all. And he died on the cross to forgive us of our sins and to give us everlasting life. You can't do anything except ask him right now to come into your heart and just believe him right now. Does that make sense? Say amen. Would you like to go to heaven? Say amen. amen. And let's everybody pray this prayer. Come on, let's do it. My dear Heavenly Father, I want everybody to pray now. Come on, one more time. My dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving Jesus to live and to die and to be raised from the grave. I confess to you that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself, but I ask you to come into my life and cleanse me and wash me and make me whiter than snow and give me a home in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Do you love him? Praise the Lord. Glory. Hallelujah.